G'day guys, um, this is on carnivore diarrhea, what causes it or one of the major causes of it. Uh, it may be, mostly it usually is uh, for two reasons. One is bile issues and the other is malabsorption or recycling of bile and stuff like that. So those are the two big reasons and they happen for a number of reasons now let me just go into first covering i'll just share my my screen and we'll cover some of the aspects in terms of the um, uh, bile acids that are produced by our okay so this is from the national Library of Medicine, Physiology of Bile. So not going to read much of this because it just covers things like, you know, what is bile, um, you know. It's a yellow greenish fluid that is secreted from hepatocytes and liver cells and alters it is, as it passes through the biliary tree by the epithelial cells lining the bile duct. Anyway, and then it goes through the pancreas and then into the top part of the actual uh, gut, the small intestine. Okay. Now, we go all the way down here. And we look at the five functions. Um, most people know that it aids with digestion of fats and emulsify fat soluble vitamins. And it, oops, down here. And it emulsifies fats to, to help with the absorption. It also is involved in the excretion of bilirubin or excess cholesterol. So, because most of the cholesterol, as you guys know, is produced in the liver. Um, if you eat more, um, you'll synthesize less. And uh, bile is involved in the regulation of excretion of any excess and all that. So sometimes people's, if they, you know, if they're not genetically prone, as I said with the APOE gene. Um, genetically prone to a higher um, level of cholesterol, it can sometimes be that it's not being cleared, you know, um, as well. So that can be another factor, but, you know, that's not the purpose of this video. So, but this is the critical part. Provides an alkaline fluid. Got it? So it's an alkaline fluid in the... Um, duodenum, which is the top part of the small intestine, and it cut, the bile ducts come right out of the pancreas, and that's where the pancreatic enzymes also meet. So you get this alkaline floor that actually, so all the stomach content, which will have stomach acid around the food that's coming out of, especially if it's protein, and meat, you know, it's meat based, it'll actually have a lower pH. So it'll be more acidic as it comes out. And that's why it's important to have this alkaline, alkal, alkaline fluid, which will protect the small intestine from any damage from the acidic um, uh, content of the stomach. So that's the key thing in there, so neutralizes acid pH. So the it increases pH basically. Um, so you know, the lower down, the higher the, the acidity, the lower the pH. The hot, just for the just for general knowledge, if people don't have this, the higher the pH, the more alkaline of the chime that comes from the stomach. So the contents that comes out of the stomach. So that's the key reason. And so what can happen is if you don't have enough, if you've got a problematic gallbladder 
and your gallbladder isn't functioning properly to actually neutralize the acid, what will happen is this bolus coming out of your stomach, if you're if you've got proper stomach function, you'll be producing much higher. You won't have any burping or anything like that. That's usually low stomach acid. So if you don't have any of that, but you may have the problem of carnival diarrhea. Why? Because what the body will do to protect the gut lining, it will actually release more fluid water into the gut in order to buffer the excess and dilute the excess acidity inside the stomach, sorry, inside the intestine. So that's what it's doing. And as a consequence of that, what happens is you end up with carnivore diarrhea, loose stools. So you can deal with that by, you know, because, you know, I mean, obviously it does, just to cover this to be for completeness, it does cover, provides bacterial activity Activity against microorganism present in the ingested food, you know, so it can knock out, you know, these. It also will cleanse the small intestine of microorganisms, so it keeps down. So bile helps with eliminating SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It cleanses the extra small intestine and then gets reabsorbed at the bottom of the small intestine. Doesn't go a very small amount should go into the into the actual colon. That's fine. If too much is going in there because you've got malabsorption issues, then you've got problems as well. That can also cause some issues in terms of um, diarrhea as well. So you can actually have a double whammy. Some people, some people have a single whammy. It depends on their circumstances. And so if they're getting a double whammy, like they're using bile acids like ox bile so that so let's say and how much ox bile to neutralize that acidity and avoid the carnival diarrhea well that will be dependent on the amount of protein you've consumed so small amounts of protein should be within a an hour and a half should be to two hours should be digested so at about an hour and a half to two hours or close to two hours, you can sort of take ox bile because you don't want to, you want to basically be able to break the stuff down in your stomach and not a, and not increase the pH because that would be a bad idea. You wouldn't be able to digest things properly. You want to break down the fatty acids and the amino acids and the proteins into basic amino acids and basically fat, um, you know, fatty acids. So it's important that maintaining a good um, a low acidity, well, sorry, a low pH and higher acidity in order to be able to break these things down. So you wait for about, based on the quantity. So if you're doing smaller, depends. If, it, if it's powders like you're doing, let's say you're doing a protein, like a powder and stuff like that, most of that will get pretty much like, I mean, uh, they'll pretty much get absorbed very fast um, and it won't really have much of an effect on the stomach. So I wouldn't worry about that. Depends what you're putting in your smoothie. If you're putting in eggs and putting in uh, a lot of different things uh, like whey protein, some yogurt and things like that, then that potentially could have an hour plus, an hour and a half um, for for that to be digested in, you know, to be broken down in the stomach and digested. Obviously, if you have a quite a lot of meat, it can be you can be digesting up to four hours. So you can be um, breaking down all those proteins, breaking down all that over four hours. So you may have to consider like something like three and a half hours after a meal before you take, like if you're having one meal a day, three and a half hours after a meal to consider that. Um, taking um, ox bile I would basically if I had these sort of issues I wouldn't do one meal a day I'd split it into two meals make sure you're getting sufficient for the leucine effect for the protein synthesis we don't want small really small meals but just slightly larger larger meals to provide sufficient um, leucine for protein synthesis 
which is important. But at the same time, we don't want two hectic meals. So you'll have, you know, about half your, your daily intake in one meal, half your daily intake in the other meal. And then you'd be looking at two and a half to three hours to be taking ox bowl. You've got to play around with it to see how well and how fast your you break down things in your stomach. And if you're if you take um like ox ox bowl too early and you feel you're getting a lot of reflux, then you've probably taken it too early. If uh you know you're getting you're still getting some diarrhea, there could be two issues. One, you're taking it too late or you've got also a recycling problem at the bottom of your small intestine. And some of that is actually um, bile, more bile rather than the 10 odd percent, more than 10 percent is going into the colon and actually causing some of this problem as well. Because um, it can be problem, bile can be problematic in the way it reacts because it can kill off you don't want to be killing off part of your gut microbiome in there. So there's issues there that can cause some derangements as a consequence. Um, so we don't, we want to be reabsorbing properly. For that, you may need to get choline, not only taurine, but choline and um, milk thistle to help heal and improve the functioning of the liver and the gallbladder. So it depends on what state you are, but I would I would definitely do choline and taurine to fix a gallbladder. Milk thistle, I would only add it if I if I was having malabsorption, um, reabsorption issues only then. So you were doing you were doing basically the ox bile, but you were still getting diarrhea, and then you'd go, okay, I've got a problem here. Um, I'm not recycling. Um, the bile acids properly. There's a, an issue there. So then you'd be dealing with it. And that can be for a lot of reasons. It can be extremely congested sort of gallbladder and and a lot of um, a lot of sludge, like bile sludge in the ducts and all that. And things are just not moving properly. And so we need to regulate the FXR enzymatic pathway to sort of control the the way that all works so there can be issues it's a bit of playing around with that um it's not a sta straightforward thing i'll just stop sharing so the take-home message is that it's really a question of playing around with these sort of when to use ox bile and the amount so play around with the amounts and all that and see how it all works. You know, if you're taking it too early or too much, you may get sort of reflux effect. And that means uh, I need to leave it for a bit longer. If you're until I start, you know, until some of that uh, chime actually starts going into the small intestine. But if it's then the other problem you may need to basically take it in a smaller amount to sort of get the effect of neutralizing, but without sort of having too much ending up in the colon um, until you can sort out and improve the functioning of your gallbladder. So yeah, it's, it's a matter of just playing around with these sort of things, guys, until you can sort of get it right. Um, if you do need to consult with somebody do consider um uh, bart k he understands these sort of things and um, can provide you with information and guidance um when it comes to these sort of issues plus you may consider some testing as well just to you know like an ultrasound to see at what state your gallbladder is at as well um there's also endoscopy tests you can do basically to check your stomach as well to see whether there's any issue um, beyond just the the potential um, there. There are certain tests you can do also for H. pylori. So if you've got excessive amounts of H. pylori as well, which could be a different issue where 
you're not breaking things down properly and uh, you know and then you may need something to improve acidification so and then and then you may not be getting carnival bait um diarrhea but you may be getting you know like lumpy stuff that not that hasn't been broken down properly and that can create issues as well so there's a lot of issues that can cause um gut problems especially when you've been on a species inappropriate drive for a very long time and your digestive tract isn't working properly so this is just to cover carnival diarrhea in a sort of a generalized way the things that are driving it um to a large extent it's probably going to be something to do with your gallbladder and stomach comb inter interaction that's going to be a play and then the protective effect of actually increasing the water content in the actual gut to have that neutralizing effect on on the acidity level in order to dilute it and reduce the risk of actually causing any damage to the gut lining um, it's a protective mechanism it's a good protective mechanism um, it's not the fault of the diet, but it's the fault of, you know, our underlying conditions. Now, the things that we can do is if we, we notice this sort of problem, I usually say to people, if you've been doing for a very long time, a plant-based diet, transition slowly, use these supplements and transition slowly in order to allow the body to adjust. So you may still consider taking using some, you know, some carbs in that transition. Like you can, you may go down for a. I've sort of recommended recently to somebody just to give them an idea, um, especially if they've come off a plant based, and they're finding a difficulty you know, in adjusting to a high fat type thing to go for the first month to come down just to one hundred and twenty. Um, grams and just up their fat slightly see how they feel um and uh, and then be you know as they go into the second and third month to sort of transition to a lower amount between 50 and 60 um grams while increasing the fat slightly and playing around and see how they feel if you're not digesting as well maybe ease up you know come back up to about you know 80 80 grams maybe still have some low oxalate fiber foods you know things like you know lettuce um things like um you know pumpkin the less sweet stuff the less sweet pumpkin or even better zucchini um some gherkins stuff like that uh, which can be low low carbish so you could take a bit more of that and it's not as punishing to the gut compared to many other plants also fermented plants in a in a sense are much better less problematic a lot of the anti-nutrients have been broken down and they're going to be less problematic for the gut but also help with that sort of transition effect as well providing some fluids but also some some bulking agent so you've got the bulking agent on one hand where a lot of bacteria the type that, that like to use fiber can actually create a, a more bulkier, more firmer, um, while at the same time providing certain fluid to protect the lining. So you can use that as a transition, you know, you know those sort of foods transitionally wise. Um, and it's really to play around with that. It's not a mad rush to the finish line um, in terms of carnivory. You know, if it takes you six months to be able to transition to full carnivore and you're going to feel much better, do it that way. It's, as I said, guys, it's not a race. Um, you, if you've been doing species inappropriate things for a very, very long time, you may need to a more tr longer transition period in order to avoid a lot of these, let's say, uncomfortable transition um, steps. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to avoid because it's not practical for a lot of people. Let's say people have got jobs, people have got families. They can't basically live their life off a toilet um, or, you know, have a whole lot of other issues that are creating, you know, making life very uncomfortable um, in a jail. So we need to sort these things out 
so we can progress properly and play around, as I said, with certain foods, items we don't want. We want to avoid things like kale, spinach, all the, you know, um, different like almond powders and all this sort of stuff, the, the high, uh, the high um, oxalate type foods. And we want to stick to sort of lower oxalate foods, in particular, you know, zucchini, um, kosh, kosh lettuce, uh, gherkins, things like that, which, which, yeah. and a few, and a few other type of, uh, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of out there. Anybody can, look, just go online and actually to look up a number of, uh, low oxalate foods. I've actually got a video as well. Oh, I'll stick the, some of these videos, the, you know, that provide some information about the type of oxalate foods that are out there, which ones to avoid um, and which ones you can use in that regard. It's a matter of playing around with these things and sort of transitioning in a way uh, which isn't like a rapid way. It's all about managing the transition and not doing it too rapidly because that tends to create a lot of problems. Now, if you're young and you don't really have a lot of the problems yet, you know, a lot of young people transition smoothly without many problems whatsoever. It's usually people middle-aged or older that have been doing species inappropriate um, eating for a very long time. And I've got a, a number of underlying conditions. They may, you know, you know, have, pre-existing for the last decade digestive issues. Now, those people are going to be at higher risk of these sort of transition issues than people that are very young and don't really have any any of these symptoms. And especially if people are coming off like a very highly refined diet and stuff like that, they're going to have less of the problems for them. It's more high blood sugar and stuff like that. So, you know, they're already having hamburgers and stuff like that. So they're getting some animal foods in there. It's just a Randall cycle for them causing that type of inflammation. So once they eliminate that sort of stuff, their stomach acid is working fine. Their gallbladder is actually excreting because they're getting enough animal foods. As I said, it's more people that have been doing plant heavy diets mm -hmm. that usually have these transition problems and usually tend to suffer, um, uh, you know, carnival diarrhea. It's not the people that are transitioning in another another fashion. And uh, I even noticed it myself when I transitioned um, because I did quite a lot of paleo and, uh, and a lot of keto and low carb, and I did a lot of carbs and stuff like that. And I was going, I was tending to go more to the plants Um and, and less to the animal foods because it was sort of popular within the low-carb community. And then I realised it just wasn't working for me and I shifted back and then I started taking out the plants and all that. But I still did suffer because I had underlying gallbladder issues. Um, I did, still did suffer on and off for about two years. But I wasn't like some people get continuous. It was sort of on, off, on, off. And it was more due to my gallbladder was working fine and all that it was in my bile ducts that I had and and in my gallbladder I had some sludge that was sort of intermittently coming out here and there and so occasionally out of nowhere I'd get uh, you know some diarrhea effect or some issue and then it would go away and so I had that through two years you know on and off like one month one incident you nothing for two months and then another incident so it was a bit very strange, and it usually is sludge that hasn't been completely cleared out that is causing this problem. Um, so, you know, I was just unlucky to have that sort of complication and that sort of uh, issue for that period of time. But most people that have not been doing a plant-based approach have far less transition problems, even in middle age or, or older it's primarily people doing excessive amounts of plants that actually tend to cause this problem with a gallbladder 
um, isn't being used, utilized on a daily basis, and you end up creating more stones and sludge in there uh, for the simple fact it's the old, you know, um, use it or lose it pretty much. And so by not by not use it, using it, um, you end up and not eating the appropriate species, appropriate foods, getting things that actually improve the bile, which is taurine, and the emulsification, which is choline. If you're not getting those sort of foods in the body, you know, from animal foods, then you're going to have certain issues in the functioning. And even vegetarians nowadays don't consume a lot of eggs, so they don't get very much choline anymore like they used to in the past. And that's why vegetarians in the past had less of this issue because they used to consume far more dairy and eggs. Now it's shifted to very little eggs since the, through the 80s and 90s. It, it, they, you know, vegetarians were more dairy and egg heavy. And then as they moved through the 80s and 90s, they really went all the other in the other direction away from animal foods and all the way across to near vegan in some cases. And it's the reason why they got sicker, higher in diabetes, and all these other problems is because they went far more plant plant based across um, where the early 1950s low Melinda type look, you know, as Gundry um, uh, has said in his because he was a cardiology the cardiologist there, you know, the diet was pretty much 50% um, dairy based. Add to that eggs and all that, it's nearly 60 to two thirds animal based school, you know, because they didn't consume meat. Some of them also consumed some, some fish. So it was a very different vegetarian diet than what it is today. Let's just put it down like that. And so obviously no wonder the figures look much better in those old associated studies compared to they don't do any modern ones do they and if they do they only do them in comparison to extremely sick sad dieters so but they never do comparisons with the past because it doesn't look good especially when you look at the food guidelines that they used to follow back then in the 50s the vegetarians and what they do today so yes so fundamentally we need to get more animal foods if we're going to actually improve digestion in general but for some people there's a bigger hurdle in terms of transition time and uh, doing it in the in the way that it's going to cause them least discomfort and that's important because people have lives to live anyway i hope you got something out of it see you